All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are happy to have Dr. Mark Thorson on with us today. He is going to be presenting on oral health training, the annual CNA requirements um, in nursing homes. So we are happy to have him. Let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. So Dr. Mark um, Thorson joins us with a plethora of from the University of Minnesota in the School of Dentistry. Um, his career experience includes clinical dentistry, dental manufacturing, professional dental sales. Um, he is a passionate educator, which again makes us very appreciative to have him join us today and provide this education for all of you. He is a serial entrepreneur and he is also available for other oral health presentations. So Again, we are happy to have him on with us today, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thank you very much, Callie. I appreciate everyone's attention. I'm happy to greet you from beautiful Gillette, Wyoming. Uh, everything is uh, as it should be here in the winter in Gillette. Everything's leaning towards spring, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, yes, I am additional uh, available for other presentations. Uh, we can move to the next one, please, if you would. Uh, we have some really good topics for you today, some of which you are definitely familiar with, but some of which you may not be. Daily oral health care, oral, uh, or the, the combination of oral and general health, uh, oral pathology and cancer, oral cancer, uh, the way that dentures impact, uh, have a new, uh, impact on nutrition and longevity, and uh, end-of-life care uh, relative to the oral cavity. Uh, we'll continue now, if you would, next one. You have definitely seen all of these things before. Most of them are for you from your own uh, dental practice visits, but you definitely also have them for your daily care in your residential care settings. Uh, we'll talk about all of them, so one more, uh, one or two of them more than others, but uh, the, the lip balm that you see there, dentists are giving out lip balm now. Uh, because the, our lips are a part of our oral cavity, uh, and they're important to be maintained and looked after and, and uh, just to uh, help us feel better about ourselves. Uh, floss is there, the brush is there, a little teeny tube of toothpaste that they give away is right there. We'll be talking about those things in a little more detail as we go. Uh, next slide, please. Brushing. Everyone does it, right? Not right doesn't always happen, is not always assumed, and brushing the correct way is not always assumed, uh, nor is the use of a correct brush. The vast majority of brushes that you do see are going to be soft. Uh, the packaging must say soft or the big capital letter S. Don't ever buy one that says medium, and for heaven's sake, don't buy one that says firm or extra firm. Firm and extra firm are good for cleaning auto, auto parts and maybe guns, but they don't belong in your mouth. Uh, they only last about three months with regular daily use. Even though the bristles may look fairly straight, there are those who would argue that that's not going to clean well enough. Especially if you see a brush that rather than bristles like this one, where everything is straight and parallel, this is a brand new one. I ah, just had my teeth cleaned. Uh, brand new. That's wonderful. But if you see them with bristles that are all fanned out sideways to the brushed out sideways, that brush is not good for your mouth anymore. And that, that's why you got to keep paying attention. And when you're working with your clients and your residents, look for that for their benefit. We'll be talking a lot about your impact on their well-being through the oral cavity. It's very important. Another step to take is when you open the head of the brush, run it under the hot water tap. 10 seconds, please, before you put any toothpaste on it. The proper word is dentifrice. You may see that in some packaging somewhere. Maybe not. But the amount of toothbrush to be placed on a tooth on a toothbrush is the size of a pea. Not like in the picture on the box, not like the, the toothpaste commercials where they scoop it all over the place. It's similar to shampoo where the directions say lather, rinse, repeat. You don't need to wash your hair twice. You don't need to brush your teeth with 10 times the amount of toothpaste that they uh, that all is, is necessary. Make, I'm going to demonstrate now on an artificial mouth type of dont, uh, because if I brush my own teeth, you wouldn't be able to see what's going on. Uh, but you can see that 
we are not bent. There are no straight lines in the mouth that represent scrubbing, scratching, scraping at the tooth or the teeth or anything else. Everything is small little curves. So make small little circles. Take your time. Many, many experts recommend having a time limit or a timer. You can even buy a kid's toothbrush with a timer built into it. That's terrific. Uh, speaking as parents, which I'm sure some of you may be, uh, and a piece of advice I would give you unsolicited is that if you brush and floss at the same time you tell your kids to brush and floss, they'll do it. But if you just order them from the living room to go brush your teeth and go to bed, like when I was a kid, how often did you do it? And if the jig was up and mom said later, come and let me smell your breath, did you brush your teeth or did you just rub toothpaste on your tub? The principle applies. No, your residents are not going to, quote, cheat on you because they may not be able to. You have to be responsible. But if you engage and you talk to them, you sing with them, you hum with them. Uh, many times, if you can't listen to a piece of music, it'd be silly for me to recommend that you sing a song while brushing your teeth, right? Same as recite a prayer, recite a poem. You can think of it in your head, but if you recite those things or talk to the, your client, the resident patient, while they're, you're doing it, that's engagement from you. You're better. They're better when you engage. Uh, the time required to br brush, if you brush twice a day, two minutes per. Two minutes, total of four minutes a day. If you're brushing once a day, which is not some dental crime, you can brush three minutes a day, but it needs to be complete. You will al already be following a specific pathway around your mouth every time you do it, whether you think about you are or not, you are. Uh, please keep that. Do it. That's terrific. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Flossing. Uh, again, people assume, here's what it is. I need to floss. I'm going to floss. Okay. Have you had formal education on flossing? Have you ever asked a dental hygienist during your hygiene visit, teach you how to floss, please? Maybe you have. That's terrific. You need to carry that into your residence. Show them what you're doing. Many of them are not going to be capable of doing it for themselves by way of arthritis, by way of other difficulties that they have, uh, that, that you're there to help them for. Put it that way. Uh, and flossing someone else's teeth, brushing someone else's teeth is different than doing it for yourself. One recommendation I can make for it to be easier for you is if at all possible, have them sit in the chair and stand behind them so that you're behind them rather than trying to do it up front, trying to watch, you're behind them guiding from behind. And if there's a mirror available, I believe there's mirrors in all of the residential suite areas. But the best technique is wind it around the middle fingers so it holds by itself. These are my middle fingers. I'm up to the close to the camera. Your fingertips may turn purple as you go. That's okay. I want that. But you need 18 inches of floss or the length of your own forearm for this to work correctly because you're going to be spooling on and spooling off the floss as you go around through the contacts. So you're not dragging this plaque over to that space. And rather than trying to control the entire length. And by the way, have you noticed in TVs and movies the characters that do floss? They're the geeks, aren't they? They're the sort of dorks that everybody makes fun of, hey, because they're flossing. And the reason they look silly is because they're flossing badly. They're flossing in a way that could definitely damage their gums, which we don't want. Uh, but please don't ever. That's not flossing. It's not helping anything. The movement back and forth is to control that inch in the middle. That's the functional floss right there. That's where it goes. And you control that middle inch by having both index fingers, by an index finger and a thumb, opposites, or both thumbs. We're getting in various places. I'm gonna try now. Mm -hmm. Finger and thumb, thumb and thumb, okay. And, and uh, then work around the entire arch. If at all possible, please get the floss behind the most further back tooth. Get behind that as well. And the movement you need to make is the up and down movement of the floss on the tooth. This is not flossing. Imagine if the windshield wipers in your on your car 
only moved that way. You wouldn't clean any rain and it would be dangerous. But in flossing, using the sideways movement to get through the contact between the teeth and then the up and down sideways movements, uh, the, I'm sorry, the flossing movements, the cleaning movements. Okay, that's why your windshield wipers do sideways. That's cleaning. This way, sideways is not cleaning. That translates into flossing technique. It may take a little practice for you to get up and down with that, get fluent with that. On your next visit to a dental hygienist, ask them to show you as well. It makes you a better CNA. It truly does. It expands your skills. Uh, if you need to use a pick type device, there are many, many of them. Some of them have a little plastic toothpick and then an arc with a floss bit to unround it. The bottom line is if it's what's available, use it. If you have one of these little teeny brush devices that has little fuzzy wrapped around the end like a small pipe cleaner, use it. There's going to be places in the mouth where the space is too big for the floss to effectively work. So you need to have this to go between. Do that. You can reach. You're helping your client to uh, patient resident that way. There are also devices for those without any teeth or areas of the mouth without teeth. The specific term is edentulous. There's a pick, uh, like a lollipop device where I didn't open this one, uh, but this is a sponge in there. And you really can put a small little bit of toothpaste on there and rub that around in those surfaces. If that's the best you can do, if there's arthritis in the TM joints or anything like that that makes it difficult to, to get in, use whatever tools you have. And there are many ways to be creative about that. Um, you will follow a specific pathway around the mouth. Every time you do that, you really have to do it. But the most important two words in flossing are do it. Next slide, please. Do as I say, not as you see on TV. That's important. The people on TV are not doing it right. They're actually damaging themselves. Next slide, please. Rinsing is as e is equally as important as flossing, equally as important as brushing. I mean that. You're still going to find oral debris, food debris, something that your brush might have missed, something that your brush might have loosened but did not come out all the way, something that your floss loosened but didn't come out all the way. Uh, it's working out in the mouth. It really is to be able to, number one, hold the liquid in place, Number two, move it around in the, in the inside the oral cavity, when I'll demonstrate, of course, in a moment. But it makes muscle tone. Muscle tone is better. It makes for better smiles. Coach them to smile. Take selfies. Be with them. Get your smiling face next to their smiling face. You are a leader in this residential care suite. You really, really are. You matter to your residents. You matter to me. I teach CNAs, or I have a program. I'm not a nurse myself. Uh, 30 seconds is a goal. If they can only do it five before they have to spit it out, then tomorrow they do it six, please. Then by Friday, they do it 10. And then keep building up, okay? You don't have to be like Tom Cruise and hold your breath for seven minutes. But I want you to be able to get your resident to work up to a consistent movement of the liquid for at least that long. That's important. And then they'll spit it in your basin um, worst case, they'll swallow it. It's not harmful, but uh, get it out. It's again, it's, it's, it supports facial muscle strength um, and helps them be be more likely to be smiling. Smiling is easier than frowning. There's a big study about that. How many muscles involved in smile versus how many muscles involved in frowns? Smile is fewer muscle. Uh, work along with them, as I said. You want to play a rinsing song? You want to hum a rinsing song? That's kind of hard. I don't recommend gargling. I don't, and people that are elderly, I don't want you to push them to try to gargle. Okay. If they can, that's great. But the last thing you want is to have them turn over sideways in the bed and whack and bang them on the back because they got water in their lungs. Don't do that. Make faces while you rinse. I call it monkey face. I also call it pelican face. Do the faces, make fun, have fun, engage, because that helps to move things around. 
purposely puff out and do the make funny faces. It's cool. Do it. Um, rinsing is also with uh, that's why there's mouthwash. You've heard mouthwash. You've heard mouth rinse. Uh, you may have residents that are old enough to even possibly ask you for the classic brown Listerine. Most people haven't tried brown because it's disgusting. Uh, and to hold that in your mouth for 30 to 60 seconds, you'd have to be in a coma not to be awake or at least totally jazzed from that oral experience. Uh, but if you go far back enough on the labels and old enough Listerine bottles, it doesn't say mouthwash. It says Listerine antiseptic. And that's the point. Antisepsis is clearing out of bacteria on living tissues. And that's what it's doing in there. It's very aggressive. Uh, but you could also take brown Listerine on a camping trip, hunting trip, if you happen to get a cut, scrape, whatever, pour it on your body. It helps. It really does. That's why it's called antiseptic. Um, but the, the whole point of it, okay, there's better flavors. The blue one and the green one, that's how I call them. I don't care what flavor they say they are. It's hard to even understand what winter mint actually means. Uh, doesn't really matter. Just like floss, use it, please. Next slide. Looking and touching. You're in the mouth, you're touching the mouth. Get some kind of a light, please. Use your own phone. Uh, you have someone that's a coworker who will have their phone light. You won't have a dental light there. You may not have a room light that's flexible enough to bend over and point in the, your resident's mouth. But get some light in there, whether it's at the same time as you're looking or not. But now I want you to glove up and gently move your fingers around in their cheeks, around in their lips. It's called the vestibule. Here, here, feel the thicknesses. If they're large people, they're going to be th thick cheeks. That's all there is to it. Uh, smaller people have the thinner cheeks. There really are fat pads up inside in that buccal space, B-U-C-C-A-L space. There's also a salivary gland up there on both sides. That's important. If there's blockage, you might know it. Uh, you might not. That's okay. My, I'm not attempting to teach you to become an oral pathology or do a cancer screen. That's for dental professionals. Your job is to recognize if something seems out of order. That's very important. You have a daily exposure to that. Feel the tongue as best you can. If something looks funny or sideways or white and it wasn't white the other day, tell your leadership. That's your responsibility. Uh, keep their dental care appointments. If there aren't any booked, try to advocate to have that booked. They are worth the care and the time and the effort and the money. They are. And it's up to you to help maintain that level of positivity with them because you're one of their greatest advocates. Uh, going on to the next slide, uh, we have talk about the relationship between uh, gum disease and the rest of body disease. But as I just mentioned, you are their greatest advocate outside of their family. Your regular consistent discussions are what they need, not judgment, not orders, not condemnation. Discussion, supportive, helpful education is great. Uh, now you can switch again, please. Next slide. Oral infection leaving the, the mouth, oral cavity, and moving to the body. Uh, sepsis, big dangerous topic. You may not have come across this. If you have, you'll probably talk along with me. <laughs> uh, but the idea of having a uh, abscess tooth, some situation where the pulp of the tooth has died, whatever that might be, that infection has to go somewhere. And if the top of the tooth is broken off, it comes out through the top of the broken tooth and goes in the mouth. And the patient says that tastes weird or metallic or strong or nasty. But in that case, it has a place to go. The infection has a place to, to leave, to exit. In the absence of that, the infection has to go somewhere. Next slide, please. You may have seen these something like this in your career, both maybe in your private life, personal life, and friends or family. But I am now charging you with the ability to see and know what this means if you see it. Many patients have told me that they've got a zit in their gums and they popped it yesterday, just right before their dental appointment. So that's okay, you don't have to worry about that. I popped that zit. That is it. That's a dead tooth somewhere or something really unhappy up along the tips of those roots. Something's going on in there. We must find, find out what that is. Your 
the seeing and looking and touching will help us get there faster and make a great uh, benefit for your client, client patient, resident. Uh, these are soft areas, uh, squishy areas. Next slide. Uh, this is, again, one of the reasons why you do stick your fingers in there, please, gloved, uh, and look around and move around. If you touch the roof of the mouth, the roof of the mouth, the hard palate, and it, it gives, okay? Uh, but if it's a soft, squishy spot, now get your eyes in there. Try to have them move their head around a little bit if that's possible. If not, you turn yourself upside down and try to look or at least put a finger in there. What do you feel? Is it Should it be hard, but it's soft? If that's the case, nurse, dental practice, soon. Because if we don't get a hold of it at this point, um, both of the jaws, and I say that absolutely clearly, the upper jaw and the lower jaw, there are two. There isn't just a jaw that happens to move up and down. Oh, I hurt my jaw. In the in my specific picky dental world, educator world, you have to tell me which one. Okay, uh, that's important to me, and I'm telling you it's important to you. The pus has to have some place to go. A collection of pus, huge numbers of white blood cells that are fighting, collecting, so they can fight an infection, some sort of bacterial origin. We got to stop it, and if we don't stop it, there are going to be pathways in the that originate from upper teeth that move. Shortly, you'll see toward the brain. And on the lower teeth, shortly, you'll see sh toward the heart. Uh, next slide, please. Our skull is filled with passages, caves, tunnels, and tiny holes. It really is. There are, there are, mm, I haven't taught anatomy for a long time, but the idea is it's not just one solid bone. Our brain is not in one solid, uh, as it's, but I do know this one, calvarium, the brain box. But there are plenty of openings into the brain box and pus that originates from a dead tooth on the upper arch, the maxillary arch, will find its way there because there are passageways. And if there's no other activity taken to stop it, find it and, and uh, block it and drain it, your brain is in trouble. And it's not as rare as people think. It's not super common, no, but it's not super rare. And you will help those designated professionals get a jump on it by your attention. Uh, pressurized pus moving away from its source will gladly follow any passage. It makes me think of that really old 1950s semi doofy uh, sci fi movie called The Blob. If anybody remembers that, it's worth your time. It's kind of cute for an old movie like that. There's even a cute jingly song that's involved, believe it or not. But the pus that moves through passageways that originates in a dying tooth and is on its way somewhere moves with sort of that creepy, pressurized uh, movement style. Next slide. This is the uh, uh, drawing of the sinuses. The upper arch you see, the, the roof of the mouth actually makes up the floor of the nose. We'll talk about that again shortly. And the reasoning that this is important is because even though it's made of bone, there are plenty of holes and movement spaces that are available. And so pus will follow that. And you see all the blood, all, uh, I'm sorry, all the uh, vascularity is the, is the good word, up to the very top there, that yellowish looks like an insect, perhaps. Uh, it's referred to as an olfactory bulb or a, a, there's opening up there in the bones. And enough pressure on that pus will get it up there, get through there, and follow the olfactory nerves. That's one of the most direct pathways to the brain, one of the shortest ones. Uh, next slide, please. In the mandible, there's the mandible itself is very thick, very heavy bone, okay? And it's not solid. Teeth are not anchored, drilled into solid bone. There's a whole lot of discussion to be had about that, that fact, but what that means is there are channels through which pus can travel under pressure, and they can move down through uh, similar channels that move down through the neck. I like to call them the body's elevator shaft. Uh, and at the top of which is the oropharynx, the place where you swallow and or breathe. Uh, please don't say pharynx or larynx, number one, because it's not spelled that way. And number two, because you're professionals and you need to know it right. L-A-R-Y-N-X, larynx and pharynx with a P-H. 
that matters. But in that in that part of the pun neck of the woods, that elevator shaft uh, will take you straight down to the heart. That space between the lungs that's called the mediastinum, and at the base of that is where the heart lives. It's wrapped in a beautiful, thick, really tight sac that's called the pericardium, that which surrounds the heart. And there's a, a filling of liquid in there that provides a wonderful suspensory function. Uh, and a comparison I would make, even though none of you will probably ever open up a person's chest, and I have not done it myself, but I know having uh, the comparisons is, is important to make the point. If you've handled anything called Tyvek in an envelope, or uh, if you know anybody in the construction industry that, quote, wraps a house with Tyvek, have you ever seen a scrap of it or gotten a piece of mail that's a Tyvek envelope? You cannot rip that. You can't. You have to cut that. And my wife even makes dog toys out of that because even the dogs can't shred that stuff. Okay. It's a similar comparison to the pericardium, that fibrous tissue that surrounds the heart. It's that tough. However, when in infection, pus gets enough pressure, uh, pressure movement and gets down into that mediastinum and surrounds the pericardium and keeps expanding, it can, in fairly rare occasions, put enough pressure on the heart to stop it. That's very bad. That's open heart surgery. <laughs> that's hospitalization. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's a big, big thank you. I got my own picture in there. It's not me, but it's a good picture. I like it. Uh, you can see that there's a space for the fluid and the way it wraps. Next slide. Big pressure. There have been deaths from this described scenario. It's important for you to be aware of it. You can head it off. You can find it by putting your fingers in their mouth and looking and touching and communicating with them and giving them your assurance that everything seems okay today. But by the way, when is your next dental visit? And let's make sure that that happens too. Uh, why would someone not take care of a tooth that may have hurt for a while and then stopped? Can't tell you how many times people patients come to me and they say, yeah, that's got a big hole in it, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Uh, it really was painful a couple of weeks ago. Oh my God, I couldn't sleep for two days. It was awful. And then it kind of went away. So it doesn't hurt anymore. Awesome. <laughs> Is the problem solved? No. Do they need to have something that fixes the problem so the difficulty is gone? Yes. Okay, why would people not do that? And the answer is they may not have insurance. They may believe that insurance is the only answer. They may not have prioritized dentistry. They may have a family history of bad experiences or come from an era where dentistry was nothing short of absolute caveman terror. That's entirely possible. So the bottom line is we're not in healthcare to judge people. We're in healthcare to help. And that's what we're going to do. We have been. Uh, these facts about sepsis are an, an important component of your daily reminders to do the oral care that you already know and that hopefully I'm expanding for you. Next slide. Oral pathology, uh, pathology, the study of disease. Three ways to define it. Um, one is to just talk about the study processes, applying the scientific method, learning. Another one is there's a, some sort of anatomic or functional manifestation of this problem. You can track certain types of disease processes because they're repetitive, they're consistent. Uh, another one, to, another definition is a departure or deviation from a normal condition. We'll be talking about several of that third right now. Next slide. I'm not compensated for this, but there's a wonderful tool or group of tools and technology that's the one I know is called Velscope. And it looks like a fancy flashlight, uh, but it creates a certain type of a light wavelength that either with or without a certain kind of a mouth rinse that will highlight tissue types or certain types of tissue problems that they're possibly degenerating into with certain types of cancer cells uh, precancerous activities, things like that. Those devices are certainly available. They're, they're invented for dentistry, but it, I don't believe there's any indication that nursing cannot touch it or handle it. That's worth your leadership looking into that. The website is there, velscope.com. Uh, 
I think it might be a wonderful tool because it's non-invasive. You don't poke anybody. You don't hurt anything. There's no pain. You're not, quote, doing a biopsy. Biopsy is one of the scariest words out there, just like cancer is. You're not touching that. You're looking with a different tool. Uh, that's awesome. I recommend to at least look into it. Next slide. Uh, white lesions. These are, many cases, completely harmless. Uh, but it's, you have to note them. And if you see them on your daily regular looking and feeling around the mouth, make a note. Tell your supervisor. Make a note in the record. There's a white lesion here. It wasn't here last week. Or it's thicker now than it was. Or it's more. It's a greater size than it was. Uh, things like that. Uh, the, the, the word that we can use, the clinical word, is leukoplakia, uh, white patch. And it applies in many, many situations. Uh, one called lichen planus uh, commonly affects oral mucosa. There are pictures of some of this uh, that's easily seen in textbooks and such. Uh, candidiasis is an infection of, of candida albicans, uh, almost always called a yeast infection or thrush. It's an opportunistic infection. It comes for lots of reasons. Um, you will commonly see it. You may have already on the tissue side of a denture that doesn't get removed often enough. Uh, white. Cut this cheesy this look inside there. Uh, that's got to be cleaned off. You, if, you, if you take out a denture and look at it and you see that's covered with uh, candidiasis, you may not re put that denture in the mouth again until it is clean, period. Because you're reinfecting. That's not acceptable. Uh, Aphthous ulcers is commonly called canker sores. I grew up with these myself. They're, they're an autoimmune dysfunction. I don't want to call it a disease. Uh, they come in times of stress. They hang out for a week to, to 10 days. And some of you may have experienced that. You may have seen such things in your resident's mouths or somebody else's mouth. I have pictures. Um, there are many ways to treat them, but you cannot prevent them. We cannot prevent stress. We cannot absolutely remove the activities that uh, would stimulate these things. And what we can... Uh, one thing I learned is that you could go to the grocery store, drugstore, and find that amino acid called lysine. And honestly, it's handfuls of these tablets. They're not chewable. Tr trust me. They, they don't chew that. Uh, but uh, if you can choke down 20 of them twice a day, you will have an impact on the on, on decreasing the longevity of the canker sores. Uh, you can also find a plant called sorrel or sorrel and break off a leaf and put that over the, the lesion until it breaks up and falls off. Do that several times a day. Uh, but you can also get topical anesthetics. Cancaid is the most commonly found one. It's essentially a 20% lidocaine preparation that's available over the counter. Uh, dental professionals will have spray versions of it. Some unfortunate patients have props of them, of these canker sores. They show up on a regular basis. They don't get one, they get 20. And it's no dang fun, period. Uh, next slide. Here are some photos. Uh, candidiasis. It shows up on the tongue. Uh, it can show up in a lot of places, but uh, in some cases, you can actually get a cotton sponge and wipe it off. And it, you may bleed. It may bleed when that happens. If that does, that means that you've done the right thing. Uh, but now you got to pay attention. You got to pay a lot more attention. Canker sores on the upper right in the, of the four pictures. That's a, a classic. Pardon me, canker sore. Uh, very obviously. And on the lower left and lower right, uh, these leukoplakia, kind of a glass-like, frosted-like uh, appearance, means very little, not, pardon me, very little threat, uh, but it's got to be noted. And if you go back next month and you look at it again, it seems like it's bigger than before. you got to note that. you got to tell somebody. Next slide, please. Uh, oral bone variations. These are called pathology. Uh, they're not disease and they're not a threat because they're variations from normal. We are required to call them pathology. Uh, Taurus palatinus, a bump of bone in the roof of the mouth. Many people don't know that they've had these things or that they are even worth talking about because they've never been in their life without them. And they assume everybody has bumps of, of bone on both sides of their lower of their mandible that crowd up next to their tongue. Oh, don't everybody have that? No, I had that conversation a dozen times in my career. Uh, it's not a problem, nothing to be scared of. Uh, but if the patient on the right when the torus mandibularis needs to have a denture for whatever reason, those bone bumps may have to be removed. And that's all doable. 
it is it's oral surgeon territory um but it happens and it's uh you know there's a modest recovery and then everything's cool make your denture uh and i don't have a photo of it but there's also something called a bony exostosis which means bone that grows out okay it's most often seen and i'm going to put my fingers in my mouth most often seen in the posterior regions along the back teeth out here outside not along the front as much but along the back what does that mean well it's a bony exostosis and it has literally no value or concern it's just extra bone uh next slide please are these things cancer? I'm restating myself in writing now. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be, as I said, tori can come off if you have to. But one of the big pitfalls for oral surgeons on, say, the torus palatinus mm -hmm, is that if they get too aggressive taking out the bone bump on the roof of the mouth, they also take out the floor of the nose. They know better. They won't do it. But it <laughs> has to have happened once somewhere. I, you know, I never got that involved with that level, but that's what oral surgeons are for, pardon me. Uh, next slide. Here's where we find more serious pathology. Uh, the, the fact that the other, and I can just restate here, do not go back in the slides. Those, those bone bumps are all bilateral or in the midline. You saw that, okay? They have symmetry. They're, that's one of the, one of the calling cards of quote, normal pathology. Uh, abnormal pathology, threatening pathology means there's no symmetry to it. It's not just white. It's red and white, perhaps. It's a thickening. It's a more dense. It's a absolutely spreading. Uh, sometimes there's pain. Sometimes those areas get warm in the mouth. That's hard to tell. Mouths are warm anyway. Uh, but if you see images like you see here, upper left, all four of these, where you have a combination of these types of images that you see and or touch. Trust me, you can touch this if you really want to. Not gonna, you know, bleed or uh, be bad. But the, your next sentence is, call the nurse. It is. And the nurse's next sentence is, call the oral surgeon right now. Okay, we're not talking about the lifespans on the clock here, but this is oral cancer. These are what's called squamous cell carcinoma. This is very bad, all of them. And it doesn't only happen in males, but those who handle tobacco, shall we say, uh, spit, chew, and I'll be talking about in writing here shortly of those things, they're leading causes, leading causes. And oral cancer can be a life altering process. It's a, it, there's no way around it. These, this, these bits of tissue must be removed, period. And the source, whatever the, the root cause is, must be found. Uh, in my training, I was, a, 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 as a senior in dental school, many, many years ago, I, I got to assist on, on the upper left picture. See that tongue cancer? Uh, that I assisted in the removal of that type of cancer. That gentleman lost a significant piece of his tongue. Uh, and I believe the survival was fairly, fairly okay, but do you call it a disfigurement? I'm pretty sure that gentleman didn't stick his tongue out very much after that, but he was alive. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now again, I'm putting it in words. I want you to engage with your residents every day. Having shown you these pictures, describe these processes. This is important as continued motivation for you to want to look. I want you to be able to relate to your residents. They trust you. You become attached. I know that. I've had several patients on my own over the years that I really hated to not see anymore, either because they passed or because they moved away or whatever the reasons were. You do get attached. Um, and I say here in the middle of this, of this slide, um, oral soft tissues are among the most susceptible because there's very high cellular turnover rates that makes tissues susceptible to things like radiation, tobacco insults, the combination of many of these habits that we have developed as humans uh, that flip the DNA switches that allow cancer to start. There's a huge conversation could be had, take another two hours, talk about where does cancer come from? Because uh, it comes from many places. 
but using tobacco, be, being in combat, uh, working in places where there is radiation, whether that's a nuclear facility, whether that's hanging around uh, aircraft that carry nuclear weapons, submarines that carry nuclear weapons. Doesn't mean they're leaking radiation. I'm not saying that. Don't hear me say that. I'm just saying that because you're standing next to a lit match, it's going to be warm. How's that? Uh, when cancer begins to grow unchecked, it can enter bone. Uh, the very last sentence I have there says that cancer recruits blood vessels to hog the nutrients in the blood and speed up its own growth. That's one of the most insidious, dangerous aspects of what cancer does. It helps itself by taking away from its host. Next slide. Do we really need gross pictures? Well, no, because they can get pretty dramatic. Uh, although I, did, I will show you and that that quote at the bottom there is a title of a newspaper article from Los Angeles Times. Maybe you are old enough to remember the Marlboro Man. Pardon me. Uh, a significant number of the actors who portrayed the macho cowboy smoking out on the range died. Died. Most of them from aggressive lung cancer. Uh, and most of them went on media tours before their deaths talking about, please don't do this. Everyone knows me. Look at the pictures of me. Now look at the side of my face. Those kind of things. Athletes, uh, which include rodeo. The rodeo culture is a very high user of uh, tobacco. Most often chew or spit. And most often started at very young ages. Where they're, you know, the eight-year-old kid is following dad, grandpa, uncle Larry, and three of their cousins or whatever. Because it's just part of the family culture that kid got cancer and now they want to tell a story about it uh there really are enough cases where the procedure called as you see in the orange box their mandibulectomy somebody had to have part of their jaw taken out i'm not shaming yeah it makes no sense but it's reality and you may have residents that have lost parts of their facial anatomy due to cancer or trauma or whatever it might be you are going to be exposed to deformity of your humans, your human patients, residents. And you just have to deal with it. It's part of healthcare. Um, so many of my dental assisting students have said, you know, oh, I just got a job. I'm so happy. It's wonderful. But is it, I'm, I'm totally amazed that the people that come in and see us as patients, their mouths are all gross. <laughs> yep, <laughs> they are. Because that's why they come to see you mechanics don't get cars off the car lot they get the broken stuff you know that's how we roll with this you you may already have this as part of your healthcare dna and i respect that but i want to reinforce it uh, because it's part of who we are next slide uh the impact of dentures on quality on, on life longevity people who have no teeth live year live eight to nine years less lifespan there's research on that People who have nice dentures made by experts have their ability to chew increase by a maximum of about 50-ish percent. You still lose things when you have, even if you have dentures. Now, further, the great is that we can support the, the dentures by implants, with implants. That's even better. And the good news is that implants are very, very common now. And they're, they're able to be placed in literally everyone. You know, they don't put them on little kids because the jaws aren't grown all the way yet and it may be a challenge for the elderly to place implants because the bone is now set the bone is very very hard bone is much less flexible in the elderly age ranges uh, but if they have them already and the dentures are supported by implants when they're attached by strong magnets sometimes they're screwed in with beautiful little gold or platinum screws uh okay but it goes back to slide one. Your job is to help to maintain and keep that as pristine and perfect and pretty as you can. And you still have to do it because plaque still builds up. Whatever food debris may still be around. Uh, and some of us may be in places that's hard to reach. I get that. But you still have to put the effort. Give them your effort. Still continue to engage. The upside is that there are plenty of tools available in the dental offices and in the implant surgeons offices and everybody 
I got to be careful. Dental implants are not only placed by surgeons. Okay. General dentists place implants all the time. It's very common now, but they will have devices. And if there was a way to, to shorten or make more easy, make easier, pardon me, your ability to help, there should be a tool for that. And if you think you could need something, ask, 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 please. It's not for your benefit necessarily. It's for the patient, the resident. Do it for them. Do everything you can. And if they can get them out on a daily basis, say they are held in place by magnets, do it. Treat it like an denture. Okay. Um, you can use water flossers. Uh, the most common one's called a water pick. And get in there. Move the food debris. Take one of these little beautiful sponges on a stick. Rub it around. Get it in there. It's only a sponge. There's nothing aggressive about that. Uh, use your finger on a washcloth if you must. Okay. And then, of course, wash the washcloth. Get it out of the way. Don't bring it back again until it's been washed. Uh, if the resident is in a bed or a chair and you can stand up behind them, if you can stand up and look in a mirror while you work with them, they can engage with you visually. Uh, you can put your face down next to theirs and watch what's going on. If there's a way to get more light involved, give them some sunglasses. Do whatever you have to, to get as much effort in there. That really matters, and it matters to them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, some more graphic images. Um, you can see a denture that that uh, will clip into on the upper left. They've got the implants themselves up into the maxillary jaw bones. And those are there permanently, okay? B because they look like they're threaded, please don't misunderstand that it's not just a self-tapping wood screw that gets ratcheted in place and then left alone. This is a whole involved process. The bone actually regrows around the titanium implants themselves and it is anchored there. I have one myself from many, many years ago. It's been there for at least 25 years. It has moved a millimeter. Okay. So I want to make sure you understand that there's a significant discussion to be had. If you really want to research dental implants, rock on, go see it. It's impressive. Okay. It really is good. Uh, the image on the right shows what's called a fixed partial denture. And the average person in the world would say, I got a bridge. And that's great. But now they've got to clean under the bridge. And in this case, that won't be removable, okay? Uh, that's why the word fixed is used. Momentarily, we'll see removable partial dentures. Uh, this is a bridge which is not. It's either cemented there or it's screwed in with beautiful little screws covered by that composite resin and removed when the doctor thinks it's necessary. Uh, but now you've got to clean under there. And there are beautiful answers, which are what are called floss threaders. There's a product available called Super Floss, which is amazing. Uh, and just get to know it. If you can if you can find it, ask for those things. Again, I'm not compensated for any of that. It doesn't matter. But that's going to be your responsibility daily. And if the patient can help you, awesome. Resident can help you. Have them help you. Teach them. But the job still has to be done. Uh, next slide. Standard dentures, partial dentures, and flippers. You've probably seen all of these. Uh, yeah, full denture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, let me ask this, though, and I bet you already know the answer. Which of those two, upper or lower, is most commonly going to be in the mouth around the clock? The answer is upper. The answer is because the lower, even in the most experienced specialist hands, doesn't stay as well. It's harder to eat with lower dentures in. That's why people don't use them as much. They're valuable. And they're made to fit, and they generally fit. But they're, people don't keep them in long enough because they see them as a nuisance, or they're difficult. Or they laugh once, and the denture flies out of their mouth, literally leaves the mouth. Uh, it's a bad deal. Uh, partial dentures there, as you can see, everything that's, that's pink is missing teeth. So the one on the left in that white framed picture is only supported by two teeth. The one on the right, the lower partial denture, is supported by, I believe, five or six teeth. Um, lower partials stay in place very, very well. They do. And the, the little flipper in the bottom is something that most patients fall in love with because they think it's the lifetime answer. And they, they don't want to avoid the cost or the time or the 
perceived difficulty of having a dental implant or two in this case might be two but you can see in the back right of that black flipper picture uh there's a little wire there a little it's meant that's called a clasp and it's meant to hold around and be snug around that one tooth and be the sort of the balancing point for all of that uh, flippers move in and out the little clasp wires get bent they get lost they get you know it's a problem there really is a problem. It's not meant to be long-term, but many people treat it like it is. Uh, cleaning these is the same as you would do with your regular teeth. You get the beauty of taking it out of the, out of the mouth and <laughs> handling it in your hands instead of having to reach over and put your fingers in their mouth. However, next slide. The cleaning process for dentures is looking, touching, feeling, smelling. If you take it out of the mouth and it's got white crust or removable spoopy cottage cheesy uh, candida in there, you got to get that off of there. And then if it's you, if you see the cottage cheese candida, you got to look in the mouth now because it's that denture has been there too long. Chances are very strong that that area where the denture sits is very red. It's very highly irritated and needs a prescription for antibiotics to help kill that fungus because it's a fungus. And scraping off the denture, if you can scrape it and get it clean again, do it. But if you can't just remove it with a normal uh, toothbrush or something that's, you know, I've had people tell me they take a spoon. Uh, okay. Uh, go to the dentist. They'll clean it. They'll scrape it. They'll get everything down to the denture and make it all wonderful. But that's what you've got to do. Okay. Because that is one of the entry, entry points for candidiasis to become a systemic sepsis. It really is. When you go there, the doctors will, and or hygienists or staff members who are trained to do so, clean it, make it perfect, beautiful, awesome. But when you stand over a sink and clean a denture, I hereby direct you to fill that sink halfway with water, not one inch, halfway. And even though your CNA exams preparation tells you that a paper towel in the bottom of the sink is cushion enough, it is not. Don't do that. I cannot tell you how many dentures were broken by being dropped on a paper towel in the sink from one foot. If you drop it up from your own elbow waist level and it goes on the floor, I guarantee you that's a broken denture. That's a that's an expense of at least $2,500. To make a brand new denture, that's what it'll be. Um, you absolutely cannot get away with, Not I don't mean you specifically, it cannot be expected that super glue at the break points of a denture and then hold it together very carefully and push really hard is going to work. But it's not. That patient must now see a dentist and have that denture replaced. Uh, next slide. People deserve to eat well. Your, your residents deserve to have as much experiences in this time of their lives as they've ever had in any other time of their lives. Um, and that includes good food, that's good smells, that's good taste, that's textures. That's them remembering what a T-bone feels like. And that may not always be possible, but if we can help to get there or move them toward it, all the better. And if they have a clean denture and their teeth are pretty, I want you to take selfies. Sit down next to them, lean over next to them, get a bunch of absolutely fabulous smiles in there and put them up all over the walls. Do it. You're helping with their mentality, their emotions, all of those good things, and they get to eat good food too. They get to have a variety of flavors. Next slide. You can read these, I think. I'm not going to read the whole works to you. Um, I'm coming up to the end of my time, but one of the two points out of this whole slide that really make a difference to me. One is that don't leave your dentures in the truck over the weekend when you're off on a hunting trip or camping. It gets hot in there. Dentures are not made of steel. They will alter because of high heat. The next point is if dogs get a chance to even find it, they'll chew it. They'll, they'll destroy it because it, it's, it's as good a smell and flavor combination to a dog. Pardon me. That's why they jump up on your bed when they first wake up in the morning. The first place their nose and tongue goes is at your mouth. The same reason. To a dog, it's fabulous. And to a dog, a denture or a retainer, or a night guard. Cats couldn't give two hoots what that looks like, tastes like, smells like. 
dogs think it is absolutely the greatest treat they could possibly get. Uh, there's a story there. You can see it later if you want to on a playback. Um, but the guy who did fix his own denture with super glue and got away with it. Mm. Uh, next slide. At the end of life, oral care is just as important as it is any other time. Just as important. It needs to be a part of the routines. It needs to be a part of their understanding that life goes on and that they can still be comfortable. They can still have a measure of pride in their oral health. And when it's the time to pass, give them the dentures. Put the dentures in. When family comes to view their past loved one, they should have a filled out facial structure. They should look like the person that they know and love. Don't let them be the collapsed face, no dentures. Uh, that's not pretty. And when it comes to viewing and things of that nature where the family will take part, undertakers can do a really nice job and they can, they can make things happen that are unexpected, are good. But if the dentures are there, it's even easier for them and the results are better. And uh, even though, I, as I say here in the bottom of this final little sentence or two, uh, even though it may sound macabre, tell the family if there's any gold dental work in this deceased patient's mouth, because it can come out. It can be removed. Undertakers can take it. Uh, one of my uh, dental colleagues here in good old Gillette, Wyoming, recently told me that they were requested by a, by a family member of a deceased patient of the doctor to, can you come and do a house call or wherever they went to the care facility or wherever it was and take out one of grandpa's teeth for us? And the doctor said, nope, I won't. Because you know, and then you know, I had to charge you for a house call. I got to charge you for an extraction. I got to charge you for all these things. And you don't need that. So will a dentist be doing it? Don't know. Will an undertaker do it? Don't know. But the family must, at the very least, be informed that there's dollar value in the dental work in this deceased patient's mouth. Uh, next slide. I will just say thank you. Um, I appreciate your attention. I believe I'm at the end of my time here with about a minute left. I want you to see here at our training business, Wyoming Professional Training, we've created a sticker here. It's to indicate that no one is just anything, okay? We give these to our students. We've been having it in function for about a year, and it's been very important. We teach CNAs, dental assistants, veterinary assistants, front desk and customer relations people, and many of them have the idea that they're not all that important because you're just a, well, you're not just a CNA. You're not just a mom. You're not just an LPM or, or pardon me, LPN, a custodian, a receptionist. You're important. The work that you do will not otherwise get done. This is very important to us in terms of self-esteem, acknowledgement, and we've had such a strong response from our students and even local businesses have seen them around, have come and asked for them. We're going to make them available soon on our company website, our, uh, and, and the address is, my email is here on this screen, but the web address is wyprofessionaltraining.com. If you have interest in, in these kind of stickers, we're working on other merchandise as well that would be beneficial. But please get in touch. Uh, I'd be very happy to help. And again, uh, any other presentations, I'd be very happy to, to take part. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thorson. We do have a couple of questions. Um, one question is in regards to CMS regulations. In lieu of our oral health presentation today, we are going to do our Mountain Pacific sharing out suggestions for compliance. Tomorrow, we'll actually touch on the regulations for nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities. So that goes out on our listserv. And after, those are also available on our Mountain Pacific website, which I will drop the link in the chat here in just a minute. And then a question for you, Dr. Thorson. Um, Somebody wants to know, how does alcohol affect the mouth? If alcohol is, cons is consumed frequently enough, it can change the pH. It, it, it doesn't necessarily alter the, the what the salivary glands produce, but it does sort of re-educate the surfaces, the, 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 the cellular activities. And 
it alters the the the, the pH to an extent. Um, I've seen a few alcoholic mouths where you would not know that there was anything wrong. In fact, the the mouth looked pristine. It didn't seem to have much plaque. It didn't seem to have any calculus. Um, and then the teeth were just fabulously white. Uh, but that patient was absolutely 100% alcoholic. Uh, it's it's more a concern with the the rest of the body's activities. Um, if if the question pertains to will some of the alcohol cross into the body by way of the oral cavity, the answer is no. Except for swallowing it. <laughs> so just some follow-up. Side note on the alcoholism mouth, it's the medications that they are on that impact their teeth. So I, not, just a... I don't know that answer, the, the true answer to that. Uh, if there, if your your uh, viewers are seeing that and they're exposed to their patients who are taking specific medication to try and beat the alcoholism and seeing that there are dental issues in terms of decay or otherwise, then I won't say that name. I, I'm my career did not include the ability to have such a drug involved in the process. It was, in other words, I'm old. <laughs> All right. Um, is fluoride containing toothpaste fine for those who cannot rinse or spit? Yes, because the amount of fluoride that's put into those products is very tightly controlled. Um, the, yeah, the only way fluoride toothpaste, as, as described, is a threat is if somebody literally ate an entire tube of toothpaste an entire full-size grocery store tube of toothpaste and ate it and swallowed it. Uh, and if that happens, the believe it or not, the, the glib answer is give them two, mi two milkshakes and an ice cream cone because mm -hmm. calcium binds up the fluoride. If it's a child, it's a whole different story. If it's a, 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 yeah, there have been pediatric, pe pedodontic deaths from very high levels of fluoride products consumed, but that's that's very rare. Okay, it looks like all of our questions for today. Um, we appreciate you again, and we thank you. I dropped your email in the chat, so if anyone is interested in following out with Dr. Mark um, directly, he can, or you guys can, and the web webinar from today will be posted on our website for review. And you can reach out to your account managers as well if you need any assistance locating these resources and tools. And again, thank you, Dr. Thurston. We appreciate your time and joining us today. And that concludes our presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you, Callie. Thank you, Mountain Pacific. Thank you all for viewing. <laughs>